This is the history section of this presentation, and it's key to understanding universal de design for learning. We also need to understand its background and where it came from. In the early 70s, architects began to understand and that buildings needed to be designed in such a way to allow access for everyone, not just people who could walk upstairs, but people who were in wheelchairs and people who needed a different way to get into a building and get access to that building. So what the architects did is they came up with something called the universal access idea, where the buildings were built and designed with access for everyone in mind. They didn't just say, let's go back and tack on these things at the end, but let's start with the design in mind for universal access for everyone. So they began during that time to structure buildings with access for everyone at the beginning of the design process rather than waiting until the process had already been completed. This saved both time and money in the structuring of those buildings. Now, in other places it began to show up is in elevators and other places like mailboxes and things where Braille was actually installed in those items so that people who have a visual impairment can actually tell what floor they're trying to get to and know what buttons to press in their elevator, for instance, or know which mailbox in that building is theirs. So these things started becoming part of the design process instead. Another example of this are sidewalk curb cuts. And when cities started putting these curb cuts in place to give people access who were in wheelchairs access to the sidewalk so they can easily navigate the sidewalks and get back and forth. Well, a nice feature of this is as this, these curb cuts began to be developed, uh, people with strollers, with walkers, and other types of implements found them also very, very usable and very convenient to be able to move back and forth on a sidewalk. So something that started as a basic idea for those with disabilities became something that everyone could use. And that's really one of the concepts of universal access for all. And now we see education. It has become a place and it has a place in education as well. But what it's causing is curriculum redesign just as architects began to redesign buildings at the beginning of the process in order to provide universal access to everyone, curriculums have to be done the same. And part of this presentation is going to be talking about some of the needs for that curriculum and why and what the access is about. Education has to be inclusive, and that's why it's important for the universal design for learning in a classroom, because universal design was for access for all, not just a few. And historically, much of the curricula that has been developed over the years has been developed for a very narrow group of people that fit the perceived mold of what, what they ex society expects. Well, in your classroom, a very small minority of people actually fit that mold. And there's a, quite a bit of diversity, even in what we would call a classroom that doesn't have people with disabilities in it. This classroom has people of varying learning styles and profiles, and they also need to be brought into this idea of teaching for everybody a universal design for learning. Now, there are seven principles to the universal design for learning. Universal design for learning encourages contact between student and faculty. It develops reciprocity and cooperation, promotes active learning, provides prompt feedback, emphasizes time on task, communicates high expectation, respects diverse talents and ways of learning, and just to go back one slide, all of these things, if we were to tack on at the very end of our curriculum, instead of redesigning the curriculum as a whole, these would be very difficult and time consuming to implement. But if we began our design process of our curriculum and started over again so that when we develop the lessons and the assessments and the means of presenting material into it with these seven principles in mind, we can transform our lessons and transform our teaching so that 
everyone has access to the curriculum instead of just a few. And following these seven principles is much easier to do at the beginning of the design phase rather than trying just to add on at the end. All right, well, this concludes the history portion of our assessment, of our presentation. And I encourage you to take the assessment here and then move on to the next portion. Thank you.